going to talk about a few things. Identity theft, what's FDIC, what's it cover, insurance, recognizing the need for insurance. And I should stay right here. It's basically a rule. If you're a financial planner, you have to introduce insurance to people because if, if I don't introduce insurance to a couple and they have a kid and the husband dies, I get sued because they didn't tell me about insurance. So I have to bring it up and my clients have to make the decision whether or not they're going to buy it. I don't like insurance. In the, this is like Vegas. The odds are always on the house. Right? They know all the statistics. They know everything. It's all in their favor. They're not going to lose money. You're going to lose money. Right? But I can't tell that to somebody and say, no, you don't need, don't buy long-term care insurance. And then two weeks later, they get hit by a bus, they break their hip, and, they're lied, they're, and now they need long-term care insurance. Right? So it's, it's, risk factors exist. Do you want to insure against them or not? We're going to talk about some of those risk factors. It's the different kinds of insurance that are out there. Okay. So does everyone know what FDIC is? FDIC insurance covers checking, savings, some deposit accounts, and CDs. So it covers um, single accounts, joint accounts, trust accounts. So let me ask you a question. If, you, if you're married, right, and you, ha you and your spouse have a $250,000 um, joint account, can you have a $250,000 single account as well? And will you have coverage? What if, you have a th what if it's 350 joint and 250? No. You have, you have 100,000 out, right? Right, okay. So everyone, everyone understands how that math works. It does not cover investments. So it's checking, savings, deposit accounts, CDs. Beyond that, no coverage. Anything else, no coverage. There's something else called SIPC. Doesn't cover the investment, covers against fraud. So we're, there's two things we're gonna talk about, elder abuse and identity theft. This is the number one crime, growing crime out there. And we see this in phishing. You've, you get those emails from Nigeria, right? Has anyone ever gotten a phone call in the morning, 7 a.m., this is your son, I'm in jail? You know, anyone's got that? I've had, I've known four people that have gotten those calls. Wow. One of them wired money. So, I mean, verify. <laughs> okay, someone calls and says so and so's in jail. Verify where they are first. Um, and if it doesn't make sense, it, I mean, it doesn't make sense. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a self check. So right in here we've got we've got nine items. You can go through and do this. Score your deal. I. So my office has a lot better score than, than I do. Um, the one thing that, does everyone shred everything that they throw away, all the financial documents, or do you throw them away still? Raise your hand, do you shred, or do you throw them away, yeah? Shred? Not like your bank statements, credit card offers. Credit card offers you should shred? Shred them all, yeah. Absolutely shred credit card offers, yeah. Because you, I, I've just heard this as a story, but imagine someone steals a credit card offer, and they sign up as you, credit card gets delivered, this person's gonna lurk at your box, steal your mail three, four times, they get the credit card. They can actually build an identity off of that. So I had a banker tell me once that um, the ch your checks, they don't look at signature lines at all. Not at all, it's all number based now. They put them on there to make you feel secure, but it has nothing to do with security. But something has to be there, otherwise it Right, put a line, an X, whatever, that, but the, they don't look and say, oh, is this their signature? They don't do that. They have your signature on file, but they'd have to hire more people to make that work out. So I have a special place in my heart for the banking industry. Um, so this is what, you know, if you're a victim, file, file a police report. This should all be pretty obvious, right? File a police report, contact all your credit cards, follow up in writing. Um, and there's this, let me see if, I can, if we move forward, do we have it? Yeah, 90-day fraud alert. There's seven years and there's a sort of a credit freeze. So when you have, I almost want to, I haven't done this yet, but you almost want, I almost want to do this so that any time any lender ever wants to pull my report or put something on my, they have to call and ask me. Yeah. Right, doesn't that, it makes you, but you think about how many different things you would, you don't want to deal with that, right? So for simplicity's sake, we don't do that. But, you know, if, you're, if you've gone through it once, I guarantee you do this from then on. It's a, it's a hassle. So I'll tell you, I'm, I'm going to, because this is protection and it's not an exciting topic, I'll tell a couple of stories. So we had a, uh, 
Um, we had a gentleman in North Berkeley who had uh, a caretaker. And we talked to him, and, and he would write checks, $50,000 to his caretaker. You know? And you discover a little while later that, that um, in the year and a half, $400,000 went to the caretaker. And so um, Nancy in my office sort of uncovered this. And the attorneys came in. And we, we, actually, we actually broke up a ring. There's like probably a dozen different people that were being cared for by, by a different group, you know, same group of people, um, all tied together, all sort of talking about well, how do they do it? You know, what do you, what do you say to the person that you're taking care of? How do you get them to give you money? Um, but so, there's only, I only have one real way to say this. I, have client, I had a client that was 85 years old, wonderful human being, just liked to call and talk, right? Just wanted to converse with somebody. So this, we're going to go through details here, but I tell you what you can do is if you know someone's elderly, communicate with them. You know, be a friend, because they will want somebody to talk to. And if you're just there, it's much less likely they get taken advantage of, just because they don't need that companionship. So it's something to, to, to think about. Actually, uh, when I was, I was taking a course at GTU, do you know, is there a Reverend Hung Shur at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery? Yeah? So he took, a, he took us up to the City of 10,000 Buddhas, and we did a course on filial piety. You know what filial piety is? It's a few people know what filial piety is. Okay. So those are the people that did Asian studies. Uh, fil fil filial piety is uh, um, respect of elders. It's, it's simply put, respect of elders, taking care of elders, right? T taking care of family. And in that, in that process, it just, you know, my parents gave me the first 20 years of my life, and they, and they took care of me, did everything for me, whatever. So at the end, last 20 years, we, we should do that for them. And we don't. In, the, in our culture, we do terrible at that. We're horrible. I know so many people, even clients, that, will, that their parents go into a, a, a facility and they see them once a week, right? So this is what elder abuse is, right? Taking money or property, um, forging checks, documents. I have, a, I have a CPA friend of mine who uh, is in Berkeley, and they've got a neighbor that they're just real close with. Real. One day, she just turns up, she's just missing. No one has any idea where she is. Her husband's there and wonders where she is. I mean, they, they, walk, up, they walk down to um, eat in the, in, the, in the neighborhood, and they're always around. They're sharp people. There's not, wife, gone. And she's like, okay, what's going on here? The daughters came and took her, right, and just disappeared. And they went out into the, into the um, what is it, uh, Central, Central Valley. That's where they're from. We didn't, no one knew where she was for a week. Then finally there's a phone call. There's this, such as, you know. And what, the story that came out is the daughter said that the husband was stealing from her. And while they were out there and the, and the husband was gone, people snuck into the house and took like antiques and took stuff out. So they, they, they created this ruse. The family created a ruse to get into the house to take all the valuables. It's just... It kind of blows the mind a little bit, why, what people will do. So these are the folks that do it, right? Anyone that you know of that's near, nearby, substance abusers, any relatives, friends. Um, and you can, I mean, you can read this as, as anybody, but anytime you have somebody that is lonely, partially incapacitated, not even lonely, alone, they're a target. Does that seem reasonable? And we should reach out to them, right, as the community of folks around them. So there's, there's the story, uh, the gentleman, a different gentleman, who he will buy anything somebody calls him with. Right? So I have a lawnmower. It does this amazing thing. So I don't have a lawn. Oh, it doesn't matter. It'll also do your bushes. It's fantastic. He'll buy it. He'll ship. And he's stacks of boxes. This is, this is how we discovered this. You go into the house, unopened. You know, shirts, uh, pants, belts, just all kinds of clothes don't fit him appliances, you know, three washing machines, just whatever somebody calls him with. Long yeah, whatever. Just, just buy everything. Every now, I don't know why that is, but I think just my experience with some of my older clients is they just they want to communicate with somebody. And they'll say yes yeah. to keep on the phone and talk to you. Uh -huh. Right? And it's incredibly sad. Uh, and yet, I, you know, if I'm alone 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I'm going to want to talk to somebody. You know, it's just, it's human. Okay. So these are the folks that are at risk. Um, unfortunately, from the beginning of the presentation, you know that we all learn lessons at the, at the, 
at the feet of our grandparents and parents. So we have here unfamiliar with financial matters. That's all of us. You know, and when we're 70 or 80 years old, I mean, you're, you're here learning about some of this stuff, and maybe you already know a lot from previous experience and things, but if you fast forward 20, 30 years in your life, you're going to feel the same way. You're going to feel unfamiliar about finance. I might feel unfamiliar about finance because the world changes. And remember this, every single day, the media, they're listening to the radio, they're watching television, and the media is filling them just like it's filling us. And if they have dementia, they don't have the tools to deal with it that we have, and we don't deal with it well with panic and end of the world talk. So it just makes it more necessary for, for people to communicate and for, to reach out. So what can you do? Ask questions, communicate. So in all of this stuff, whether it's in which we're gonna talk about legacy, we're gonna talk about investing, communicate, 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 communicate. This is all psychology. It's not about, it's not about what markets do. It's not about, it's, all, it's about what we think and how we behave. Everything is. Success, failure, it's what we, we, we to an extent, we choose those things. So take the steps, okay. Um, did anyone here employ elderly? Uh, what? What? Does anyone here employ caregivers, like for your parents or anybody? How did you find them? Were they, were they private or were they a company? So I have three clients that have, that have been in, well, a couple of their facilities, but three that have actually hired care for in the house. All three went to individual people they found off a Craigslist, which, which I think, which, I, which blows the mind to me, right? And they, they had family that helped them, support them to make the decision, and they, uh, and the, one of them is the one we, story we told, which they just got totally taken advantage of. So it's, the agency is more expensive, right? You know, the good brain surgeon is more expensive too, but you don't want to go to, you don't want to go to a mechanic to get your brain looked at, so. If there's one thing that you write, want to write down, this is something to think about. If you ever run into the situation, place to call more information. All right. Insurance. Oh. All the things that might go wrong, this is what insurance protects you against. So remember, remember the definition of financial planning? My definition, right? It's taking responsibility for what can go wrong. So you have the opportunity to plan for what can go right. Full story. Um, I didn't have life insurance. I've got two kids, my wife. My, my uh, father-in-law is pretty well off, and uh, so I just assumed, you know, if something happens to me, they're going to be taken care of, no problems. So my wife tells that to my father-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> Not okay. <laughs> so now I have life insurance. <laughs> uh, but uh, so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm a minimalist with insurance. <laughs> I'm totally minimalist. So we, we've, got, we've got the car insurance because it's required. They're going to have health, you know, we have health insurance, obviously, through the company. But... Uh, life insurance is something I never wanted to have, never got, but I got because, you know, we got family pressure for that one. Uh, it's also a good idea. I, you know, I read story, I'm in the industry, I read story after story after story after somebody who has a kid and, and gets injured. You remember, um, you know the Maxwell family that founded Power Bar in Berkeley? Okay. So, um, uh, Dave Maxwell? I don't remember, I don't remember the, the, the CEO's name, the, 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 who actually you know, with sawdust and water in his kitchen sink, created the first power bar. Uh, but uh, he was a marathoner, right? Ran marathons, power bar was an energy source. Uh, I think he was 50, 45 maybe, heart attack, died, three kids, right? So this happens a lot, this kind of thing happens. Uh, so it's, it's definitely something you want to protect you against the things that could happen. Small price, big benefit if you need it until you factor in 20, 30 years of that small price. You know, that 20, 30 years of a premium can go towards that retirement income, that asset base that has to be a certain level to create that kind of income. So this is why we, we put it out here, we talk about it, it's an issue, but it's one by one. Every person makes a decision. How many people have earthquake insurance? How many people had a week ago? <laughs> right? Okay. See, I, I don't. <laughs> I have a nice house, no earthquake insurance. Should I? I keep, ah, I should, maybe. I think about it, but. So there's, there's lots of reasons to, uh, to, look, to look at insurance, basically to protect yourself and your family. These are the kinds of insurance, right? We've got life insurance, health, homeowners. If you have a home, you have homeowner's insurance, or uh, if you have, anyone rent and have renter's insurance? Rent and you have insurance? Good, good. It's, it's rare. 
You're required to, right, of course. So auto insurance, we all carry. What's the minimum deductible? Not deductible. Minimum liability on auto. I think it's, I think it's one three, right? 100,000 property, 300,000, right? So does anyone maintain the minimum? So I, just, this is my insurance agent talking to me, so take this with a grain of salt. Um, you know, the minimum gets you nowhere in terms of the health care for somebody that gets injured if you're in a car wreck, right? You, then you forfeit your assets, right? So if you have $300,000 um, liability coverage, you're in an accident, someone is injured, that's a day and a half in the hospital. So not enough, right? So and that's when we require to have. So does everyone know what long-term care is? Wait, let me back up. Does everyone know what disability insurance is? Disability insurance is the insurance that gives you your income should you not be able to work. Okay? It doesn't cover any medical, just it replaces income to about 60, 55 to 65%. Okay? And you pay for disability insurance as a percent, you know, how much income do you want? That's how much you pay for. Right? So if you want to have $100,000 of disability insurance, that's what you pay for. There's short-term, there's long-term. Um, I never recommend short-term disability. Long-term disability, if you own a company, if you're a, if you're a business person, or you're, you're, you, you know, contractor especially, something like that, you want to have that. Does so everyone know what long-term care covers? I said this earlier, if you get hit by a bus and you break your hip and you can't move, what it covers is your care if you have two activities of daily living that you cannot fulfill or dementia, early onset. So if, you're, if you can't, so I had, a, I had a friend of mine who lived on the top floor. Uh, her kitchen was downstairs. Her bedroom was upstairs. To get between them, she couldn't get there. She broke her hip, had a full body cast. So she qualified, and she's 38, I think. She qualified long-term care insurance, and they paid for someone to come in, cook her meals, do all that kind of stuff, take care of her while she, until she healed. Right? And then the nice part about some long-term care policies is if you wait long enough, if you're not, so if you use it for two years or a year and a half or whatever it takes to heal, and you don't use it for five years, it starts all over. You get the insurance back. And your premium, you just paid the same premium the whole time. So there's definitely an advantage when you're younger. Everyone else, you know, most people know. <laughs> what? Get hit while you're younger. Yeah, get hit while you're younger. There's accidents, right? That happens. So the, the, the way most people think of long-term care insurance is they think about that insurance that gets you into the home, that pays for the home. And, and so, I have so many clients that have benefited from that insurance. And when we, you know, people come into the office, they already have that, and, and they're incredibly happy that they have it. That's one of the most, of all the insurances, when you look at the statistical likelihood of using it, it is the most used insurance for people that have it, is long-term care insurance. More than car insurance. It is used, you know, 50% of the people that have it use it. It's an, it's an incredible tool. Um, but if you ever get it, inflation rider. We talked about the annuity. Someone, we talked about the annuity with somebody here. And the annuity is nice because it pays out. But if you don't get an inflation rider, your $1,000 today is a lot less value than $1,000 10 years from now. Same is true with long-term care. If you have long-term care insurance, get an inflation rider. Why? So there's lots of reasons. You can control. It's part of the plan. The thing I think about is, again, when I'm, I'm factoring in legacy, so I want to leave something behind. So for me to leave something behind, if something happens to me early, I can't do that. So for me, it's, a, it's an asset protection tool. It's a way for me to protect a nest egg so that either my kids get it or the charities I love get it. Because otherwise, you know, you can live a long time. I can, I can live a long time in a facility. My grandfather lived till he lived 15, 20 years in a facility. I can, I can spend all my capital. Right? It can be gone. My kids don't get anything. The charities don't get anything. So for me, uh, long-term care is, is that. Also, life insurance is often used for, if you don't have the capacity, right? If you don't have a lot of assets, you can actually create a legacy with life insurance because you're going everyone's going to die, right? So when you, what if what if when you die, your life insurance policy funds a trust that funds the charities that you like during your life? So there's planning tools you one can use life insurance to do. And if you if you if you die with a with, if you are lucky or skilled or great and you die with a lot of money, you could also life, use life insurance as an estate planning tool to pay your federal taxes, so that your entire estate goes to your kids and the charities you love, nieces, nephews, family, et cetera. So there's all kinds of ways to use 
insurance in a sort of a higher level planning, not just protection. So this is kind of, you're smiling. I, I have a question. Sure. Whole life and term. Difference between whole life and term. So there's, rather than use whole and term, I'm going to use cash value and term. Because cash value covers whole life, universal life, variable universal life. So there's, there are types of life insurance where you pay into and all it does is give you insurance. So this is term life. Term insurance is you pay $150 a month and if you die, you get a 20 year policy. If you die in that 20 years, you continue to pay your premiums, you die in the 20 years, um, the money, the, the benefit goes to your beneficiaries, okay? Cash value policy, you have a half million dollar policy. You have, you pay instead of 150, you pay 1,000. So $850 goes into a cash value account and that cash value is invested and can grow. And so you're paying the difference, your insurance, you're paying for the difference between the benefit and the cash value. So the amount of money, the amount of insurance you're buying decreases over time. So the cost of insurance goes down, right? But your cash value goes up. So you actually can use that nest egg for lots of things later in life if you don't die in the time frame. You can actually turn that life insurance policy into an income stream later in life. My problem with, um, with uh, cash value life insurance is ex it's incredibly expensive. And the break-even point, because the benefit is, is tax-deferred growth in the policy, the benefit doesn't really come out for seven or eight years. And you know, I've done planning for a long time, and, and clients generally don't stick with the behavior for seven or eight years to, to see the first benefit, right? And even that, they don't use that benefit for another 10 years. So it's a, gr it's a phenomenal tool, but it takes, it's a, there's a long run-up to its use. Disasters. Uh, we're, we're gonna, you're gonna get this, what to have ready for disaster preparedness, what to keep, where to keep it. Does everyone have a safe or safe deposit box? Uh, you, should, you, should, you should have those documents somewhere. I mean, we, we live in fire zone. You should have a fireproof, waterproof safe because what's gonna happen? Which documents? Um, great question. So your passport, your, your, your health healthcare directives, your trust documents. Um, you don't have to keep statements in those things because those are all held in the cloud these days. It used to be that you'd want, you know, one, every year you'd want one statement to go in there just so, and just in case the grid goes down, you still have proof that you own this stuff. Now it's all, you know, triple backed up in, in the cloud. So we, just like we did with the identity theft, we did the same thing with disaster preparedness with financial documents. So right here, uh, I, you know, driver's license, insurance cards, social security cards, passports, birth certificates, those are the kind of things you want to have in a, in a real safe place. It's number two. I want to, there's one thing I wanted to point out here. Number eight, if you, does anyone have, I don't want to call anyone out, but does everyone have smartphones now? I got to say, I recommend them. Because you can actually get to all your documents, everything, right here in your, in your pocket. So one of the things when, when, eventually the grid will come back up and you'll have access to things. You, you, just have, you don't have to have a storage unit, you don't have to have a safety box, it all goes in there. So when someone does a financial plan in our office, one of the things we have is we have what we call the vault. The vault is in the cloud. And anything they choose to store in their vault, they can put up there. So you can put your healthcare directive up there, your trust up there. If you travel a lot, you can put your health insurance up there. Um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of stuff you can put up there. And it's, it's uh, same, same company you know, protects it as protects bank stuff. Well, Secure Guard, I don't know what the name of the company is, but um, I love iPhones or droids, if that's your flavor. Um, so any questions about this part? Boring, I told you it was gonna be boring. I hope I lived up to the expectation. Nope.